Welcome back to Our God and We. Before we get into the video, please take a second to subscribe or follow. It would mean the world to me and really help support this project. Thank you again and enjoy the video. Welcome back to Our God and We. I am your host, Stephen Stapleton, and today we are joined by Durante Berenger. Durante is an Andover Newton seminarian and a Black Church Studies student at Yale Divinity School. In addition to being a seminarian, he is also a change management consultant within his firm, Digital Capability Practice. I'm sorry. <laughs> in his spare time as an Atlanta native, Durante has begun his journey into outdoor activities, breaking into activities such as fishing, hunting, and hiking. Brother Durante, I am so excited you are here. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, bro. I'm yeah. Happy to be here. Uh, so glad to see you. Yeah. So I kind of want to start with your testimony and mm -hmm. kind of dive into the thick of how did you come to know God and how has God impacted your walk be in a place like Yale Divinity School now? Yeah. So honestly, it starts. It starts with my mom. Um, as I was growing up, my I didn't grow up in church, really. So yeah. like the church culture has just become a part of my lived experience. But as a child, um, I was all, I mean, I was, I grew up in Atlanta. I was always around um, Christian folks, particularly Christian black women. And I know we, how we talk about um, the idea that black women are the backbone of the church. And truly it was black women in my life that set the foundation for faith um, and unveiled or unfolded um, how God works in the lives of other people. So um, I remember my mom always talking about God. And even as a little kid, like, you know, you could say like a child doesn't really understand who God is, but I really did and do feel like there was something innate or intrinsic about this God and, and uh, the reality of this God that always kind of, sat in me and so i remember even as a kid just talking to god you know yeah, yeah. um and knowing that god existed and that was never a, a question for me and it wasn't because my mom said it, it was because in my heart i knew it to be true um and so as i got older i started to read the bible more and more and I fell in love with scripture, particularly Proverbs, um, uh, the story of Solomon in First Kings, and then uh, um, Revelation. Like those three books in Genesis, but really those three books in Job. I remember as a kid, I loved Job. Um, those books informed my understanding of God and made me hungry for God. And like I remember when I read about Solomon and his prayer to God for wisdom. Um, I prayed the same prayer, right? So like, yeah, yeah. There, is, there is this, as a child, and this, I think that was around like maybe nine or 10. So from a little kid all the way to like, you know, uh, being uh, pre-adolescence and then adolescence and then all of those things, like there's this constant uh, hunger for God. And then as me and my mom started to go through life, both the good and the not so good, um, being homeless, uh, dealing with betrayal and all of those things in her adult life, me being bullied and all of these things, I found solace in God. And I think I even saw God, another place where I found solace when I was going through my own like, sort of affliction uh, with bullying was anime. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw God in anime. And as you know, anime deals with God a lot. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and they have their own interpretations of what God is, sometimes mm -hmm. evil, sometimes in between, anime. right? Um, and so even that interested me because it reminded me of Revelation in some sense. I see Revelation yeah. as like this big anime. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. No, totally, totally. Um, and so, yeah. And so when we, when we went through life, seeing my mom go through things, it didn't seem the miracles that happened. Right, like seeing my mom cry and pray and all those things, and then seeing God in real time act like and things I knew as a kid, like for example, like my mom was like, We need this money to get from point A to point B, and then you know, we don't know how it's gonna happen. And then my mom would have like a, a, a 
large amount of money, like check come in the mail and she didn't know it was there. It would be unexpected to her. And so I was like, yo, this God is acting. And so when I read the stories of Solomon and Job and other folks, I was like, I took it to be true in the sense that God acts. Mm. Right. No, totally. Um, and so that was that was part of it. And then I would say for me, as I got older, um, it was it started to be not removed from my mom because that always influenced me. And like I like I, I learned that my grandma anointed me when I was a little kid before she died uh, on my paternal side. Um, I also learned about the opposite stuff, which is like on my maternal side, my grandma was a root worker. Mm. Um, and so she dealt in witchcraft. And I know there's different sets of Christians who say, well, witchcraft has been demonized by colonialism. But the stories I know about her, I'm like, nah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I, dis- I humbly disagree in the sense that like she used root work for evil um, and truly evil, like manipulation and all those things. And so I think even in that, I started to understand that God was not that, right? Ooh, um, yeah. And I knew, like, even when I was a kid, I remember we were driving to my grandma's house. My mom was, I forget who else was in the car. So she was like, I'm going to leave you with grandma for a little bit. And I was like, no, don't leave me with her. And I remember, I remember that day as a kid, I remember how strongly I felt in my spirit because she was wearing this black hat with a rose on it. I'll never forget it. And I remember looking her dad in the eye and said, do not leave me with her. Um, and she hadn't done anything to me physically or anything like that. It was just like, I knew she was evil. Yeah. I knew her heart. Um, it was that spiritual discernment. It was spiritual discernment. And so even this, the gifting, like I saw like that being done through me. Cause I was like, I don't know how the kids are intuitive, but like to that level and to that, that deepness and depth in my spirit, I was like, I don't know why I felt that other than discernment. And so all these different moments, all these different things started to, to really show me that God is real yeah. and God is active. Um, but I will say I did not know that God had God continues to unfold God's self in your journey with God. And so your understanding of God can't be stagnant. Right. I mean, it can be. You mm-hmm. can. But like if you're walking with Jesus, right, God in Jesus, right, there it's just like walking with another human being. Like my understanding of you can't be stagnant, but 100%. with God is even um, um, exemplified exponentially because of the infinitude of God. And mm-hmm. so for a long time, God was king and Lord. And I love it. Even though I didn't really understand those concepts, I knew that meant that he was here and I was, I was here. Yeah. I was not <laughs> also here. Like, I was not Lord. <laughs> and he was something different, but yeah. I accept that. I didn't think it was, like there's, I see this problematic because I was like, this guy takes care of me and my mom and the people in my life. Um, so that's that's kind of like the the first part of the journey. But I don't know if I should keep on yeah. going. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's great. It's it's interesting. I think as you're laying out sort of your your testimony, it's so fascinating to see the 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 generational influences that have uh, culminated in your mm-hmm. life and then now getting to the point where i mean the texts that you're drawn to are like the wisdom text of the bible mm-hmm. so like how how has sort of your walk with god and beginning to unfold god also been on one hand this surrender of a god who acts and on another hand wisdom to act yourself mm. that's a Good question and a complex one. I'm gonna do my best to answer. So I would I I so it really started with that prayer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um because I knew wisdom was something that I wanted. Um and this was at 10. And I said, I told I asked God, I said, make me the third wisest person in all of this. Mm. I still really want that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I was. I still. I'm like. I, yeah. There might be some humility in there with God. I'm like, I will give you wisdom, but chill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. So I prayed that prayer, 
And then eventually, even as a kid, people would start to talk about and remark um, on my my maturity. Mm. Right. And yeah. then eventually people would start to say, oh, you're so wise for a kid. And it didn't click for me for a long time that that was an answer. But uh, of my prayer, that God was answering my prayer, because this may sound supernatural or mystic, but even like my ability to comprehend texts mm-hmm. started to become a little different. And like I, I and it wasn't because anything that my mom did, like we grew up probably lower middle class, yeah. if not working class. Um, and so I didn't have the best education. There was no reason why, you know, but I think I was like in uh, eighth grade. Uh, no. I was in sixth or seventh grade reading on a 10th grade reading level. Um, and I was like, I did nothing. Yeah. I didn't study. I didn't do my homework. <laughs> I was a horrible student. And people may not believe, but like yeah. I I would prioritize Dragon Ball Z over <laughs> studying. Yeah. And I got my fair share of Fs too, but the Lord <laughs> was mm-hmm. there. Um and I think in that though, there was there was a change in me where I sought knowledge and I sought understanding even as a kid. And so I like I, I went from like reading manga and I still read manga to reading, you know, about the history, the colonial history of Japan, right? Um or I well, I guess colonial isn't the right word because they weren't truly colonized, but the his the shift from um the shogunate to the Meiji era, right? And yeah. like I was reading that as like a ten year old. Oh my goodness. And so like yeah. there are these things that I think start to shift in me without my own push. But I think I went with the flow of it, right? And yeah. started to seek out these things. And then eventually, um I think there came a time when I think it was really in college where I was like, God has given me wisdom. Not mm-hmm. because I thought I was wise, but because it just, at that point, it's kept on coming up. And I was like, God, you've answered my prayer. Like, I can read these texts by these people. And like, I, I remember I was at Bard, and it was LNT. And LNT is learning and thinking. Um, it's an orientation, fall orientation. Uh, and it's a fantastic orientation program. And yeah. so they give us, they gave us a binder of texts. Um, it was 2010. And the question was, what does it mean to be human? I'll always remember that. Because um, it's a question that I think we should continue to ask ourselves. Um, and so we had texts from Judah Butler, Derrida, Kierkegaard, other folks. Uh, we read Metamorphosis. Um, not the one by Ovid, but the, I forget the name of the other guy, but the one with the Mother Church of Spiders. Um, <laughs> and, um, I said something in class, and these were kids who grew up more privileged than I did. All of them were white, except for yeah. my friend Trey. Um, me and Trey were from the south, southwest Atlanta. Uh, and I said something, and they were just like blown away. Mm. I don't know how where, where that came from. My, yeah. my, I had not read these texts. Like There was another girl in there who like had already read Plato's Republic. Uh-huh. And they were bringing in a whole bunch of these like sources that I knew nothing about, but I was able to keep up. Yeah. And I was like, yo, I could be selfish and be like, I'm just gifted. Or I can be humble and be honest with myself. I'm like, yo, God is answering my prayer. Mm-hmm. Like God is in this. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think that's, that was like the crux of that moment where like God like God giving and then me taking and moving forward with it was was kind of like came at a meeting point. Like that was kind of like a catalyst. And then mm-hmm. as I started to learn more about what it meant to be black, what it meant to be a man, what it meant to be all, like all these sociological systems and political systems, all this stuff, I think I started to realize like I wanted wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Um, and so I, I started to idolize it. Um, so much so, I was gonna. I was gonna ask okay. that. Um, I had a dream one day, and it was when I was like, it was maybe two or three years ago. Because um, in this time, I also started to get into Norse mythology, and I fell in love with Odin, 
because Odin is like the, the embodiment of wisdom. Yeah. And I love that because I want it to be that. Mm. I want it to be like, I want it to just consistently attain wisdom, but I think what once became like for God became for myself. Um, and very much the thing about Odin is like he like hung himself on Yggdrasil um, for nine days. And I think that was influenced by Christian theology. But he hung himself in a tree so and took out his eyes so that he can gain um, near omnipotent wisdom. Oh, wow. Right. And honestly, as I read that story, I was like, I get it. I would do the same thing. <laughs> Goodness. And I was like. It's a scary place to be in. It's a scary place to be in. And I think also, like, at that time, like, I was experiencing depression, too. So it was weird to be in that space. And then I really think God was having a conversation with me because I had a near-death experience in 2020 um, during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and um, This drink, so I had the near death experience. I came home a couple of days afterwards, being in the hospital, and um, I had a dream, and Odin was there, but like the the uh, the mythological, not like the one you see in Marvel. Yeah, it was like this gray haired, bearded man with a cloak, a black cloak. It was like the way they described Odin in uh, some of those Viking shows. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he gave me a fruit. And I took a piece of the fruit. And then we were in this forest, this beautiful green forest. Um, and I ate it. And then I was, like, I was, we were transported somewhere else. And people were, like, doing this, like, weird, like, movements and stuff like that. Um, and then I heard this voice say, Durante. Uh, and then I turned and in my heart, like consciously, I was like, that's Jesus. And then I turned and it was Jesus standing um, under a tree. I'm mm. um, in a tunic. And then he said, walk with me. And so we started walking and talking. Um, so it's two embodiments of wisdom, mm. right? One, I perceive, I perceive to be worldly. Yeah. Um, and the other is, the, is where I originally started as a child. Yeah. And I remember at the end of it, at the end of this dream, Jesus led me to this dirt path. Um, I, it seemed like it was like maybe in Palestine or Israel or something like that. Um, and he stood in front of me, right? Like literally going, going on the same path that I'm going on, but going before me, mm -hmm. right? And I was sitting down on the ground as he was standing and I was looking at his back and I said, Jesus, how do I love you? And so even then, I'm searching for wisdom, yeah. right? Wow. And Jesus turned to me in the dream and said, you already know the answer. Then I woke up. <laughs> and so, wow. right? And Jesus wasn't lying because that stuck with me. I was like, what did you mean? And I was like, oh. And as I started to get more into the church and stuff like that, and going and searching for wisdom again, but back in scripture and literally the lived life of Jesus, Currently, I started to recognize, like, oh, okay, I got it. This is so, like, part of loving God in my perspective is being obedient, right, right unto God, um, being loving, right, and surrendering. Surrender is a huge part of loving God so that God can actually act in your life. Yeah. And that relationship, that surrender allows God to be in relationship with you. Right. Because there there's a lot less clutter around your heart and your spirit. And so I was like, oh. I did know this. I get what you were saying. Yeah. Right. And I and so that kind of got me back on this path of wisdom. And I think eventually what helped me to get to YDS, because at that point, part of that wisdom that God gave me and that revelation and knowledge, understanding is to become a pastor which is something I didn't want to do. Um, and even now, like I'm attracted into in, in the, with the idea of being embroiled in this eternal project of love with the church. But or I'll say, and it's still something I recognize as incredibly heavy um, and costly, right? Um, 
And so, yeah, that's 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 like that story of wisdom. And so now, like, I'm cautious of when I am searching for wisdom, knowledge, understanding ambitiously. Mm. Um, why do I want to do that? Where is that coming from? Is it for God and for humanity, yeah. or is it for Durante and for power? Right. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and even then, the discernment that comes with obtaining wisdom, to some extent is that discernment of what is this for? Right. And the other thing I forgot to say is like, I didn't recognize. So I read Proverbs a lot, but I didn't read Ecclesiastes. Yeah, they need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, those texts, we got to be paired they, together. They, they, people should, when they preach, they, when they, they preach, say, yeah. hey, these are connected because I didn't realize that part of the wisdom required and some people may agree, disagree with me logically, that's cool. But I do think wisdom, um, there is some connotation of suffering. Oh, completely. Right, and yeah. affliction. Because in order to empathize, in order to judge rightly, you have to have gone through something, mm -hmm. right? Or else you're coming in with a privileged perspective. In some ways, you have to don you have to don the cross in order for you to be able to act within wisdom. Right. Um, there are times where I think you can't act in wisdom without, you know, um, carrying your own cross and or not even having like experience with a certain thing. But I think when it comes to being able to judge justly, it comes with human experience. Yeah. And it comes with understanding what does it mean to be lowly sometimes? Um, what does it mean to be poor? What does it mean to be um uh powerless you know in in a space right being homeless especially living with people is a form of powerlessness because most of the time those situations have a power dynamic and i saw that power dynamic when um, me and my mom were homeless and how they treated us right um it was not the good samaritan it was what it was the opposite, right? Um, and so even in that, I gained wisdom, but I would say godly wisdom in the sense that if someone stays with me, I have the, the, the ability to know what justly, how to treat that person. Yeah. Right? Um, because it's not, it's, something, it's not really common sense, right? Some people may say it is, but it, to treat someone well, I don't think comes commonly. I think it's an act of wisdom, right? Because sometimes treating people well may be in defiance of and contradictory to the moment that's happening, right? Mm. Right, so if someone's trying to impose power upon you, you still treat them with dignity, Yeah. right? And there's a wisdom in that. Um, and those are the things that I, I, I learned as I went through um, uh, these different types of suffering, mental health, financial, yeah. um, uh, you know, a whole bunch of yeah, a whole bunch of things. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Um, the topic of suffering came up briefly in an earlier discussion I had with um one of my friends, Kendra, and I kind of want to expand on it a little bit more with you here too. Mm -hmm. How do you see suffering also within the light of a God who is love? Right. So I was, dep I was, uh, I had major depression and generalized anxiety for three years. Mm -hmm. And I had the same rumination for those three years. Yeah. Like constantly. I went to sleep. If I could go to sleep, I would wake up almost like clockwork. I felt like I was losing my grip on reality. Right. And I was in relationships, which I shouldn't have been. Um, because I was, I was trying to find grounded. Yeah. Right. And I was ultimately using these people, right. In order to do that. Cause I was like, there's love. I can, if I, if someone can love me, maybe this will make it easier. And I didn't know that's what I was doing at the time. Now I do. Um, and there was a point where I wasn't, well, I, was I in a relationship? No, there was a point where I wasn't in a relationship. I was just, you know, doing my thing. And I remember 
there was one day it was a really bad day it was a really bad day and like i was uh contemplating making a, a plan for suicide and um i was sitting on the floor in my room and i was like god you hate me. you know i was like you don't care about me. and i asked him, i was like how could you care about someone and allow them to suffer this way like what what type of God does that? And I actually what I want is I wanted God to hurt as much as I was hurting. I wanted him to feel pain. Right? I wanted him to feel the same darkness and numbness I was feeling. Um and it took a while for me to understand like how can a God that is love allow people, not just allow people to suffer, but to 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 witness suffering yeah right um and so after being hospitalized multiple times for this for the for not knowing and not having the coping mechanisms uh, are the foundation to deal with uh the trauma of being black in america in the early 2010s mm-hmm. right the trauma of stuff that happened to me in my childhood yeah. the trauma of uh, being poor because AmeriCorps doesn't pay people a lot. <laughs> um, and being in like the trauma of, and this is a little T trauma, but like graduating from a prestigious institution just to go back to making like $23,000 a year. Um, right. Yeah. And like having mice in your apartment and having all these things and like, um, and then being homeless again for a little while. Uh, in 2014 and so i'm i'm taking all these things in and i'm like this is my life mm. this is what you have planned for me this is this is your grace um and so it was hard for me to cope with all those things and it just kind of came flooding out and then after many attempts both ones in which i was hospitalized for and the ones i wasn't um i I was like, I got to find a church. And so I, I joined the Catholic church. I'm officially Catholic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and many other things. I'm also, I'm also officially a seven day event. So, <laughs> um, so you're officially under a lot of brackets. <laughs> yes. Cover, cover all the time. Um, but uh, I joined the Catholic church, did, did all the things. And uh, we had exam and I told you about this. And um, there's this moment, and mind you, for these three years, I've been talking to God and just saying, you hate me, you hate me. I, and, I would, and at the same time, though, like, what's crazy, what God showed me is that the reason, the story that I'm about to tell everyone, the reason why I think that moment happened was because even in saying, God, you hate me, I had faith that God heard. Mm. And I think that's important because it still is, it's not a, I don't, I guess theologically you could maybe say it's a form of prayer because actually in Jane's class today, we were talking about the complaint. Yeah. Right. The complaint is still faith that God hears you. Mm. Right. Yeah. And I think we need to hold on to that because it's not like we're saying we assure you. We're just saying, this is how I'm witnessing you in this moment. He talked about Naomi who said, God hates me. And so I felt that same way. Um, but it got heard, right? Uh, and so I've been saying that for three years, go to examine. I'm like, and I told Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the triune God. And I was like, hey, I need you to come. I need you to act. Or this might be the last time, right? It was really like a life or death thing. Um, and I said, lead me. We were on Boston College's campus. I said, lead me to somewhere that has um, that has a hill, right? Uh, that I can talk and I can talk to you um, in private because I, I talk to God. Um, and so I heard in the spirit, go here. Yeah. And so I started walking. And the way I was walking, I saw a hill that was pretty secluded and he said sit there so i said okay so i sat down and i put the 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 verse that they gave me uh, i was jesuit priest 
just um and i was like this this means nothing to me mm. i don't know what i can't even think of the verse that was there and i just said what do i do with this the moment i asked the question the wind blew and turned the paper perfectly open um it didn't fly away and it was a strong wind too yeah and i said oh i got it so even in that moment even though i knew that like i was on the precipice of death which i really was um i still knew god could act because that's what i grew up with all my life that couldn't i couldn't separate I couldn't separate my suffering from the love of God. Mm. And uh, it was in that moment um, that I heard in the spirit, and it was like the first response that I heard from Jesus in this three-year argument, or really not an argument because he really, really was strong. But three-year deprecation of God's character. That's the last. Yeah. Which was, and this is what he said. He said, I am your friend. And I saw in that moment his right hand holding my right hand. And then this vision of being in the hospital and having Jesus be there with me and lamenting with me and praying with me and praying over me and all of these things and this act of love. Right, God was saying, literally, Psalm twenty-three. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of the shadow of death, and I know that was a real place, but the imagery is really important because it's like there's an abyss mm. when you're depressed and you're going through anxiety, and you're staring into this abyss and you're walking through it, right? Because I know Nietzsche talks about staring through the abyss, but I actually think you walk through the abyss too, and Jesus is there, right? And so. That changed my whole perspective about what I went through. It wasn't that I needed to go through it necessarily. Maybe I did to get to that point with Jesus. Yeah. Who knows? But I knew as I started to think about all the things, I was like, yo, this is going to happen. Mm. We're going to suffer. I do not believe theologically God wants us to suffer. But as scripture says, you will suffer, right? Jesus yeah. point blank told us that. And he even said other things like the poor will always be with you, right? So he was saying the troubles of this world will continue even after my ascension, right? And because I've gone through what you've gone through, both spiritually, physically, psychologically, emotionally, and in a way that you can't even comprehend that transcends time and space. I am there with you. Mm. I can, I understand. And in a way it's like, I don't even know if understanding is like, I'm going through it with you, right? Um, and so that, 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 that changed, that changed. And, and because of that, I was able to break out of that depression um, and, and anxiety. And um, I was able to start to really put CBT to work, but on the foundation of Jesus, right? And even more so as I started to get into therapy and all those things and recognize that what God says about me is different than what the enemy may say about me, what the world may say about me, what principalities may say about me. I knew of who I am and God and who God has said I am to him. Mm. And because a lot of the foundation of general of like anxiety and depression um are are uh maladaptive thoughts, right, about oneself and about one's space and, and value in the world and one's worth. Why is it those things, right, that that's the thing that comes up for us when we're thinking through um whether it's we we are needed on this earth because when i was going through depression and so that suicidality that was my thing it's not that i wasn't worth it was like i'm yeah. not needed mm. right yeah 
And by Jesus saying, I am your friend, it went above need. It's like, I desired. Yeah. Right. And at that point, I was like, oh, which also helped me eventually to become a better friend. As well. Yeah, absolutely. That's so that's so fast. I mean, I, I, I thousand percent agree, especially even if you're looking at the New Testament. I tend to take a more I think a more like physical belief when it comes to like some of the things that jesus says mm -hmm. in the gospel mm -hmm. and so like for me when i hear like pick up your cross and follow me i i think that's a call to like literally suffer and should you die die mm -hmm. like um doesn't take away from the fact that jesus is walking with you no but suffering is a reality it in is. the world yeah and that we have to live with yeah and in you know yeah yeah yeah, that that's I think that's really fascinating. Also, which if you you have the end there between the want to Jesus desires us, but also there's I think there's a lie the enemy tells quite often mm -hmm. actually, and it's that unless you are needed, you are worthless. Mm -hmm. And that I think that's a lie that I've heard before, mm -hmm. um, and it is a lie that is that is extremely damaging. Mm -hmm. Because then it also puts you in this sort of egotistical power of like, I need someone a hundred like reliant on me, or else I like can't even function as my own human being. Yeah, yeah. I because I think I mean you think about capitalism, right? Yeah. And that's like the foundation of it in some ways. It's like you are not worthy or valuable if you're not being productive. Mm -hmm. If you like what what we talk about when we go into the workforce, make yourself indispensable. Yeah. Right. Um, make yourself needed. And it's like, man, how antithetical is that to Jesus? Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, and I also, I think about this was helpful. This was also helpful after I had that moment with God, with the Holy spirit. Um, I remember reading about, Jesus being in Gethsemane. And I was like, after going through and feeling anxiety and having anxiety attacks, um, I was able to recognize the signs and the symptoms of that in Jesus. And I was like, Jesus felt depressed. Yep. Jesus went through depression. He went through anxiety to a point where his blood vessels started to like, yeah. And I was like, yo. That's textbook anxiety in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. I, I wrote a paper on it, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was like, but the Holy Spirit, again, with wisdom, I could not have gotten that unless I've gone through it. Right? And not saying that it was needed, but in the end, it happened. And it gave me a perspective that I couldn't have before. Right? And an important one. Because now I'm like, oh, I'm starting to see Jesus. And I'm starting to see Jesus in me. And myself and Jesus, right? Uh, I think Jennings is like, I may be using this term correctly, but he talks about like a, a, a going up and a coming down, right? Um, and that's why I feel in that moment. Uh, and I also was start like was able to to read passages about the serpent and the devil a little bit differently. So the serpent tells Eve in this story. A half truth, and I'm realizing, right, that even in the desert, in the wilderness, the devil tells Jesus, right, he attacks his identity and uses if then statements, right, if you are this, which Jesus was, mm -hmm. then you will do this. If you are truly worthy of being a ill, then this is what this will look like. Mm. And that doesn't have to be true. And Jesus fights back with scripture, right? He fights back with truth, not just half truth, because it's like the devil in that moment wasn't fully lying. Yeah. And temptation doesn't always have to be a complete lie. It can be some truth in it, right? And so I was like, but both in the situation with Eve and in the situation in the wilderness, there was an incompleteness, right? And what was missing in that was God. And so I started to recognize, like, I need to know what God says about me. 
me, but not what the enemy says. Because it's very easy to believe what the enemy says. Because the enemy is not just the the mystic embodiment of evil and the devil, but it's also people acting through that same spirit, right? The bullies in middle school, right? Constantly cursing you by saying you're ugly, you're this, you're that, right? Teachers cursing you, saying you're this, you'll never be anything. Now, luckily, I didn't have that experience, but I know a lot of people who have. Your parents cursing you, right? Because we play curses on, we place curses on you mm -hmm. through our words. We yep. do. And that's what, in the end, I see like those two stories. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm getting it. Yeah. Um, rather, whether, you know, you, you're a creationist or not, there is value in understanding what the serpent is doing. Now. Just like there's value in understanding what the devil is doing with Jesus in the wilderness, right? And how, when we do get really depressed, those attacks on our identity, we have to be able to call it out, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And just the power of even then words and rhetoric in the ways that it is portrayed mm -hmm. throughout, the, throughout the whole scriptural text. I think that's also why it is, I mean, at least for me, it is so entirely important that we place value on the written words of Jesus, like of Jesus. And I know that that's in some circles controversial, but there's power in the word to me. <laughs> like, there's, there will be, I wouldn't be here without those words. Mm -hmm. Like that's just the truth. Like it wasn't my therapist that saved me. It was Jesus. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it was, I wouldn't know about Jesus without those scriptures. There is power in those scriptures. Right. It's just that they've been used for evil throughout time. Yeah. Right. Um, so I guess we can say it's not necessarily innately good. Mm -hmm. Right. The words themselves. Or maybe they are, but maybe they can be turned into something else. Yeah. But I know for me. It was it was those scriptures. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And I mean, even then, when you're talking about the devil and the half truths that come in, it's so fascinating the ways in which throughout the scriptural text, the devil never tells flat out lies. No. Like almost ever. Like it is always constantly half truths that undermine, that demean, that, um, that cut the person down. Or if you're bringing up like in the case with the wilderness, um, half truths that aren't necessarily even, even false, but that are so misleading that they logically take you down a path that is not, um, not holy. Mm -hmm. And then to that end, I mean, what is the role of logic in the ways that sometimes? Again, this is a very this is a very philosophical, ethical question I was about this, to ask. This is the YDS question. This is this is absolutely a YDS question. And I realize that I'm as as I'm saying it, I know this is exactly where I'm where I'm going with this. But what is the role of logic in undermining morality? And then even furthermore, through that, like, how is it that in certain we're at we're at Yale right now? There's a language that is spoken, words that are spoken that must be spoken in ways that are academic and logical, and yet also entirely disconnected from the morality of the people that we claim to be trying to serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I mean, uh, we, were, we were talking about this in uh, one of my classes, uh, this idea of imperial grammars. I'm not going to like go through the whole thing, but like in the way that we speak, there is, even at YDS, even at Yale, Right. There is a sense of coloniality. There is a sense of of domination and all of these things. Um, there is a sense of value, right, and worthiness based on what you produce. That's academia. If you don't research, you don't write those books, mm -hmm. see you later and good luck getting tenure anywhere. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so but again, and it's in these spaces where I really do think the devil, or you can say the world, however you want to say it, 
um, comes into being because now you have these very real systems reinforcing the things that we tend to hear in ourselves Oof. when we get depressed or anxiety Oof. or something even t- like even I think a little bit more complex like bipolar disorder mm-hmm. or, or even schizophrenia. Right, all these things, like all of those mental illnesses, are informed by the darkness of this world in a lot of ways, and our fears, right? Um, and so I think in places like this, because even with any mental health issue, what we hear is stress exacerbates those things, right? And stress, a lot of times, I think, um, is connected to how we are viewing ourselves in a certain space, right? And so in a place like this, we have grammar and language that talks about the spirit um, and talks about Jesus and the love of Jesus. But it's like we also have papers that we have to write. We have and papers that got to be, in some sense, unreadable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. like you have to use flowery language and academic language and things like heuristic and hermeneutic <laughs> and all these things that don't talk to the people that Jesus wants us to serve. Mm-hmm. Now we can introduce that language because that language, that type of language is definitely um, gatekept yeah. within academia. Right. Um, but it's like, even I think about like how much we have to do it at Yale. How do you find time to serve the people of this community when you're being burnt out yourself? Right? Yeah. Um, and then and then again, it's like also on top of knowing that your sense of worth is tied to your grade or how well you write. Right? When it comes to relationship with certain professors, certain professors are tied to academia in a way where they won't really pay attention to you. Unless you're trying to walk that same path. Yeah. Right. Which can also impact your sense of worth. It can also enforce that half truth of you're a failure. Right. No one loves you because of X, Y, and Z. Right. And sometimes that stuff is enforced even in our, our relationships and, um, in the, in these spaces. Yeah. I think. You have to hold fast to Christ in that. You do. And I think that's the other kind of fraught thing that happens and apparently a lot of seminaries is you have this deconstruction right which can exacerbate depression and anxiety <laughs> yeah right and you don't have supports right mm-hmm. like seminary seminaries know you're going to go through this thing but they don't provide the necessary supports for you to actually go through it still having a foundation of jesus still loves you yeah i was right? i was actually just talking to um my my father's a former minister. I was I was talking to him earlier this week, and he was like, "You don't realize the privilege you have to have a, even a couple other people that are going through what you're going through, mm-hmm. because they don't talk about a lot of people don't talk about in ministry. There's not support systems mm-hmm. no. spiritually, like mentally, like support systems are few and far in between, mm-hmm. really, for the type of spiritual." task that's being undertaken mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i mean no you're entirely right mm-hmm. yeah and i i think it's even harder right in trying to spiritually understand oneself with god yeah um and be witness and now in a different way to death and destruction across the world mm-hmm. right um I remember on October 7th, I was looking at social media and I saw some of the most hateful things I ever heard um, on, I mean, I think on, yeah. on the internet. Um, and I cried. And I was like, Jesus, like, what is going on? The, the first half of the Bible may or may not be real. The, the, <laughs> the, the world is, is continuously imploding upon itself and giving, getting darker and more yeah. evil. And we're, 
in some ways it seemed like we were going forward and now it looks like we're walking back when it comes to our own standards and ethics Mm -hmm. of war um of of diplomacy um and it's like man especially i mean also the seeing from christians is how quick they were to take one side yeah and i'm like y'all are devoid of historical context <laughs> and this issue is complex and nuanced as people like to say mm-hmm. right and but it is it is complex and nuanced but there are also some spaces where i think um we're called into right as christians that disregard what academia would say or what po- yeah. what, what politics would say about the life of a person mm-hmm. right and i would say on both sides of this conflict and in any conflict the loss of life has to be questioned it has to be lamented yeah right absolutely and it's in spaces like this where that type of thinking becomes fraught because you have a whole bunch of people saying well you know because there's money tied to these things and all those things so it's like and even then you're led to a point where you're questioning oneself like about what is just and what is good Mm -hmm. and like how how do i act in this moment as a christian yeah right um and like how do i act now now like not I mean, well, actually, I would say the suffering that we see in this world, not just in that conflict, but in a conflict across the world, I'm suffering with them and I have my own stuff. And so how do I be with Jesus in this moment? Like, literally, what would Jesus do? Yeah. (laughs) Right? Like, and it's hard to, like, ask that type of question in these spaces sometimes because, well, we have the, the idea that, well, there's. There's not an answer you can land on, but there is, right? Um, you know, or it's like, well, you know, you just, this, this, this is important to think about, <laughs> right? I guess, yes. Um, it's like, well, with what's going on in the world, it's, evil is acting in real time. Absolutely. Right? Evil is acting in real time. Evil is acting tangibly. Mm-hmm. And your brain's not disconnected from your body. Right. And so it's like, and guess what? Some of the, when it comes to executing war and death, it starts theoretically. But the point is to make it manifest into the real world. Yeah. And what we've seen across history is that that happens a lot more quickly than the good taking the theoretical and manifesting into this world. Right. Um, I know I'm speaking about evil as like a, a mystical actor, mm-hmm. but also, I also do believe. It. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And I think going back, just going back to the mental health piece, like that informs um, how we feel in this world. I think like even just the, the, the um, exponential growth of, uh mental illness right Mm -hmm. among our like generation z the millennials um generation alpha whatever they call it like it's it's skyrocketing it's skyrocketing yeah right now yeah at least for i know we got to get to our our quote and then Mm -hmm. final question but i'll tell you the in my mind the minute that we lose a personal tangible physical love we've lost already and that's honestly what we see in scripture right jesus can consistently says and focuses the gospel on love yeah right and love is a thing that is not to be grasped because god is not yet Mm -hmm. not yet for me that's what i believe not yet to be grasped i do think there's a point eschatologically um or in the end time right yeah. where we will be able to be in true oneness with God. But for now, right? <laughs> there's we we can't just grasp a hold of love and say this is what this is. Yeah. Love is constantly unfolding. Oh, a thousand percent. Right. And so we 
I think we tend to have a stagnant view of love. Um, and that, I think that stagnant view then allows it to be pushed out of certain arenas in our life. Mm -hmm. But it's like, love is all encompassing. And that's what Jesus, Jesus wants us to do that in, in him. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's why, I mean, honestly, that's the culmination of testimony. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what makes Jesus credible. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Is testimony and a testimony is not about um, Jesus is productive in my life. No, it's that Jesus loves me. Mm-hmm. And he has seen me at my worst and got me out of the ditch, walked me through the abyss into a better place, into the green pastures, into the, the, um, until the, what is it, the stillness of waters, right? And I was able to have some form of inner peace while the world is. Um, just in a in a space of of chaotic darkness. Mm. Um. Yeah. 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 At least in the ways that I think about love, building off that, it it also comes from that walk with God, and also a deep self reflection of our own narrative in the lives that everybody reflected around us. Mm-hmm. Like, for me, part of my love is being able to see myself in the people that are suffering in Gaza right now. Mm-hmm. It is no less my love to see myself in, in those who are in the Israeli military. Mm-hmm. No less my love to see myself in both of the upcoming u.s presidential candidates Mm -hmm. and that's love that that both empowers and criticizes and builds and mourns and it's a love that is i think all encompassing of what it means to move in and within this world but the minute that i have an other that is so disconnected from myself that i could never see myself in them yeah like i've lost yeah i've demonized that person and and deemed them to some respects, like not worthy of their own humanity. Yeah. And then how am I any different than those yeah. who are committing acts of terror? I think that's where the wisdom of God's, of the wisdom of God, not of man, the wisdom of God in love acts. One minute. Sorry. <laughs> um, and then um, that's where we move on. Yeah. Well, we'll have to wrap up here, but it was so great having you on the podcast. Same, Thank you so much, Durante. Course, I appreciate it. We'll have you on another time, and Absolutely. I would love to continue this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and follow. It really helps support me and the communal project of our God. We thank you, and I look forward to seeing you next time.